Australia is building something colossal. A railway almost 1,600 kilometers long, slicing through farmland, floodplains, and mountain foothills. A corridor so ambitious, it could rewrite how an entire nation moves its goods. Not a passenger line, not a flashy bullet train, this is a freight superhighway, built for trains nearly two kilometers long, stacked two containers high, each carrying more cargo than a hundred massive road trucks. It's bold, it's expensive, and at $31 billion, it's become one of the largest mega projects in Australia's history. But the real question is bigger. Will inland rail change Australia forever or become the country's most costly gamble? To understand why Australia is pouring tens of billions into a freight line, you need to look at the one thing people rarely talk about. Freight. It's invisible, uncelebrated, but it powers everything. The coffee you drink, the clothes you wear, the food on supermarket shelves, the devices on your desk. Australia is massive, the size of the continental US, but with barely 26 million people. And yet, its freight system is under pressure like never before. By 2030, the East Coast's freight volume is expected to double, hitting nearly 8 billion tons a year. And right now, three quarters of it moves by road. Thousands of trucks, endless convoys, highways loaded with heavy vehicles day and night. But that system is reaching its breaking point. Heavy trucks are only a small fraction of vehicles on the road yet they cause a disproportionate number of serious crashes. More trucks mean more risk, more pressure on emergency services, more danger for everyday drivers. These trucks don't just use outback highways. They crawl into cities, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, clogging streets, slowing deliveries, choking supply chains. Congestion costs billions every year in wasted fuel, lost time, and inefficiency. Roads were never designed for this pounding. A single, fully loaded B-double truck inflicts the same road damage as hundreds of cars. Every year, maintenance bills rise. Taxpayers pay more. Governments fall behind. Australia's logistics backbone is straining. And rail, the natural alternative, hasn't kept up. Between Melbourne and Brisbane, freight trains take an old, twisting coastal route. The journey can exceed 32 hours. Why? Problem one, Sydney. Trains bottleneck in Australia's largest city. Passenger lines take priority. Freight trains wait. Curfews block them during peak periods. Hours are lost every day. Problem two, outdated infrastructure curved tracks, slow speeds, low clearance tunnels that can't handle double stacked containers. By the time a train finally arrives, a long haul truck might already be unloading. Reliability suffers. Businesses choose trucks and rail share of East Coast freight has been shrinking for years. The equation is simple. Freight volumes rising, roads overloaded, rail too slow. Australia needs a new solution. This is where inland rail enters the picture. It might feel futuristic, but the idea of a direct inland corridor isn't new. 1915. During the First World War, leaders proposed an inland freight line linking Melbourne and Brisbane through towns like Parks and Moree. The war stopped it. 1940s. Military planners revived the idea in World War II to move troops and supplies more efficiently. It stalled again. 1950s to 1990s, the concept resurfaced in reports, then disappeared. Costs were too high, governments changed, priorities shifted. But the one thing that didn't change, freight demand. By the 1990s, industry groups were pushing hard, warning that highways alone couldn't handle future growth. Finally, governments listened. In 1996, the Keating government ordered a study. John Howard's government expanded it. Mark Vale publicly championed it in 2006, calling inland rail a nation-building priority. But the breakthrough came in 2010. 
the Gillard government ordered a full feasibility study through ARTC. Completed in 2015, it confirmed what had long been suspected. A direct inland route would save time, cut costs, and revolutionize freight. Then in 2017, everything changed. Malcolm Turnbull and Barnaby Joyce committed $8.4 billion in funding. Inland Rail was officially born, a 1,600-kilometer freight corridor linking Melbourne and Brisbane. But that description undersells it. This isn't a railway. It's an engineering transformation. Modern rail design. Trains up to 1.8 kilometers long. Double-stacked containers. Higher speeds. Fewer curves. Dedicated freight priority. A bypass around Sydney entirely. How it's built? About 1,000 kilometers comes from upgraded existing track. Strengthened foundations, higher bridges, wider tunnels, heavier rail. The other 600 kilometers? Brand new track stretching across farms, plains, and remote landscapes. This is a mega project with mega project challenges. Bridges, floodplains, mountain passes, property acquisitions, sensitive cultural sites, and of course, exploding costs. But we'll get to that. Construction began in 2018. By 2020, the first segment, Parks to Nara Mine, opened. Freight trains already run on it today. For the first time, Australians could see what a modern inland corridor might look like, but most of the route remains unfinished. The vision is clear. Melbourne to Brisbane in under 24 hours. For freight, that is game-changing. Now let's zoom in. Because inland rail isn't just about connecting big cities, it's about reviving the inland towns that sit between them. Inland rail threads through dozens of regional communities, places often bypassed by major infrastructure. For them, this isn't steel and sleepers, it's opportunity. Parks the inland superhub. Already the crossroads of Australia's north, south, and east-west freight lines, Parks is transforming. New logistics parks, expanding warehouses, intermodal terminals, thousands of new jobs. It's becoming the beating heart of inland freight. Moree and Toowoomba, major agribusiness centers preparing for distribution jobs, cold storage complexes, warehousing, supply chain industries. Construction alone has created 16,000 plus jobs across three states, and the government has pushed for regional procurement meaning local businesses are winning contracts. Once operational, the workforce continues. Maintenance crews, terminal operators, rail controllers, drivers, logistics coordinators. These are long-term roles. They anchor families. They stabilize communities. Economic ripple effect. Inland Rail could inject $16 billion into GDP over 50 years. Take agriculture. A grain farmer in western NSW can suddenly ship to Brisbane's port faster, cheaper, more competitive. More export options equals better prices. Better prices equals stronger regional economies. This isn't a freight line. It's a development engine. For all its promise, Inland Rail faces serious, deeply rooted problems. Let's start with the biggest. 1. The Cost Blowout the original estimate, $8.4 billion. The new estimate, over $31 billion. Triple the cost, one of the largest overruns in Australian history. How did this happen? Critics point to unrealistic early estimates, poor planning, weak oversight, property acquisition delays, complex floodplain engineering, inflation and supply chain pressures. Whatever the cause, taxpayers are now paying far more than they were promised. 2. The delays. The original timeline, mid-2020s. Current reality. Southern half done around 2027. Full Melbourne to Brisbane link likely 2030 to 2031. A decade of delay has one major consequence. The freight crisis continues. 3. The root controversies. Queensland floodplains. 
The Condamine floodplain is one of the most complex hydrological zones in the country. Locals fear embankments could worsen floods. Lives and livelihoods are at stake. New South Wales Cultural Heritage The line passes near significant Aboriginal sites, including the Paliga Forest. Traditional owners say consultation has been inadequate, a recurring issue in major infrastructure Australia. These controversies haven't stopped the project, but they've reshaped it. To regain control, the government created a dedicated inland rail entity, Inland Rail Pty Limited, replacing the previous ARTC structure. The goal? Clearer accountability, stronger oversight, more realistic budgets, better community engagement. Whether this will be enough remains to be seen. Right now, Inland Rail stands at a crossroads. Final reveal. The big question. Australia needs a modern freight backbone. Highways can't handle the future. The current rail network can't compete. Inland Rail could fix that. If it works, Australia gets faster freight, safer highways, cheaper transport costs, stronger regional economies, a globally competitive export chain, a logistic system built for the next century. But if it fails, Australia is left with a fragmented project, over-budgeted, that arrived too late to solve the very problem it was built to solve. This mega-project is a bet. A $31 billion bet. So, will Inland Rail reshape Australia's future? Or become its most expensive miscalculation? Only time and the next decade will tell. Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Before we end, here's the real question your click deserves an answer to. If Inland Rail succeeds, Australia gets faster freight, safer highways, and a stronger economy. But if it fails, the country is left with a $31 billion warning sign stretching 1,600 kilometers long. So tell me this, was this mega project the right bet? or the biggest gamble in Australia's history? Your answer could reshape the debate. Drop your take in the comments. I'm reading every one.